Hey up everyone! So continuing the London Film Festival coverage, today's film that I'm going to be discussing on the channel is the latest film from Alexander Payne, the delightful dramedy The Holdovers, which sees Payne team up once again with his sideways star Paul Giamatti. Set in 1970 during the Christmas holiday at a fancy New England boarding school known as Barton Academy, Paul Giamatti plays a cynical history teacher called Paul Hunnam, who is universally hated by all of his students. They even call him Wall-Eyed Hunnam because of his lazy eye. Paul is tasked with the responsibility of being the school's holdover this Christmas break. What a holdover is, is essentially someone who stays on campus and looks after the children who, for whatever reason, can't go home for the winter break. So left on site is Paul, the school's head chef Mary, played by Divine Joy Randolph, and five of the schoolboys. That is until circumstances change and then it's just one boy that's left in Paul's care. Hair, the bright but rebellious Angus Tully, played by Dominic Sessa, who has been abandoned last minute by his mum so she can go on her honeymoon with her new husband, or Angus's new stepfather. So you've got three lost, upset souls who would rather be anywhere else forced to spend the Christmas holiday with each other. On paper, this certainly sounds like the premise of a cheesy holiday movie. And while I technically would classify this film as a Christmas movie, this being an Alexander Payne film means you get something far more earnest and elevated than that. The saying, they don't make them like this anymore, gets thrown around a lot in film discourse these days. But no other film of 2023 does that expression feel more applicable to than The Holdovers. The Holdovers is so distinct in style and technique that it genuinely feels like a relic that has been unearthed from a time capsule from the 1970s. It's very convincing. Like if I showed this film to my parents and told them it was made in the 1970s and they just somehow missed it, I'm sure they'd believe me. That actually might be a fun experiment to try with my family next Christmas. Stay tuned for the results. But yeah, Christmas is a time of giving and receiving and The Holdovers really does feel like a gift. And I think that's because it's so rare that we get to see a film like this made these days. And when something is rare, it feels more special to us. From the opening title cards of this film, we know immediately of Payne's intentions to transport us back to the past. The vintage Universal and Focus feature logos, the old school MPAA rating, the grainy celluloid texture, and the snap, crackle, and pop sounds of the 35mm film whizzing through the sprocket. But this acute sense of nostalgia is also present in the world of the film. It's reflected in the primary setting of Bart an academy, where you get a tactile sense of the isolation and loneliness that the three central characters are feeling over the Christmas holidays. You can practically feel how cold it is in the grand dining room, or smell the mustiness of the corridors. These are old buildings which talk with every creak of a floorboard or turn of a doorknob, and the cots and clinical colouring of the infirmary where the boys have to sleep over Christmas make it feel like a prison. Can you think of a more depressing setting to spend Christmas than prison? It's an idea that's cleverly punctuated by Paul Giamatti's performance, who is more of an academic drill sergeant or warden than he is an actual caretaker who, you know, cares. <laughs> I realized as I was writing my notes up for this review that not since The Favourite have I seen a movie with a triptych of performances that felt as in sync with each other as they do in The Holdovers. That's a testament to screenwriter David Hemmingson's finely balanced screenplay, as well as the harmonious efforts of the cast, Paul Giamatti, Divine Joy Randolph, and newcomer Dominic Sessa. The always reliable Paul Giamatti is perfection in this role. I think it was actually a role that was written specifically for him, and I think that's why they kept the character's name as Paul. But yeah, he is so good in this part, like you can't picture any other actor doing a better job than he does. We've seen stuffy, almost vindictive teachers in movies before, but often they come across as paper-thin caricatures. But Hemmingson has written such a dimensional character with Paul Hunnam, and Giamatti rounds him out by showing this almost Scrooge-like transformation throughout the film. Each subsequent scene peels back another layer as to why he's so bitter. He's a product of Barton Academy himself, albeit from a much more working class background, but he was subjected to a lot of bullying from these entitled elite kids, which has made him this jaded adult where he won't let these snotty kids breeze on by in his class because of their privilege. It's also what helped him develop his sharp, acerbic wit. Paul Giamatti gets some deliciously savage dialogue, like he's calling his kids genuine troglodytes and hormonal vulgarians. But Paul Giamatti is one of the most naturally funniest actors on the planet. Like, he had the audience cackling just with, like, a perfectly timed look of exasperation. But yeah, this is easily in my top five of Paul Giamatti performances ever. I still can't get over the fact that this is Dominic Sessa's debut. Like, looking from the performance, you would think he's 
been in the business for years. He just has this natural intensity that a lot of actors spend decades trying to master, but he's just got her out of the gate. But yeah, he goes toe to toe with Paul Giamatti in his very first film and completely holds his own. Yeah, watch out for this kid because I'm expecting big things from him. Again, it's because he's a very well-written character, but you understand this kid's angst and pain. Like, you get why he's lashing out because essentially he's a kid that's been discarded by his own family at Christmas. It is a phenomenal debut performance. I cannot wait to see what he does next. And then there's Divine Joy Randolph, who beautifully plays the part of Mary, who is spending her first Christmas alone since her son died in the Vietnam War. Christmas can be a very difficult time for some people, and no character is that more true than Mary. And Divine Joy Randolph gets so many lovely moments where we can see the grief consume her. And it's through the character of Mary where we see what this film has to say about race and opportunity, because her son was one of the few black students that attends the predominantly white Barton Academy, but Mary couldn't afford the full fees for him to go to college right away, so that's why he decided to enlist in the army first and then go to college, whereas all the other privileged white students could pretty much get into any Ivy League college that they wanted if their father just made a phone call or a donation. Mary really is the MVP character of this film because not only is she a pseudo mother figure to both Paul and Angus, but She's also the bridge between them, the mediator. She's the means that helps them see each other's perspectives. So yeah, it's a performance of great empathy and compassion from Randolph. So yeah, like a milking stool, you've got three performances that perfectly prop each other up. They all support each other, and the result is you get this perfectly mismatched trio of unlikely characters growing to appreciate each other organically. Let's talk Oscar nominations because no doubt The Holdovers is gonna be a player at the 2024 Oscars. Now that I've seen Paul Giamatti's performance, I understand the hype and I do think he stands a good chance of getting into Best Actor next year. He was egregiously snubbed for his previous Alexander Payne performance in Sideways. I'm hoping the Academy don't make the same mistake again. He did get an Oscar nomination for Supporting Actor the subsequent year for Cinderella Man, but it's high time that Paul Giamatti got his first ever Best Actor nomination. This is one of his finest performances ever. Dominic Sessa will definitely be in the conversation for Best Supporting Actor, but similar to Jacob Elordi or Charles Melton, I think he's gonna have difficulty as a newcomer breaking into a category where there are so many more established actors all vying for the slots of Best Supporting Actor. So I think he's gonna have difficulty breaking in as a fresh face. But who knows, maybe if the Academy really loves the holdovers and Paul Giamatti gets in, then maybe he could coattail off Giamatti. Divine Joy Randolph is actually the performance which I feel the most confident will get the nomination. Like even more so than Paul Giamatti in Best Actor because Best Actor is so crowded this year. Whereas Best Supporting Actress is a little bit more open and Divine Joy Randolph absolutely shines in this role. She could even be a potential contender to win. We're kind of waiting to see if the supporting performances in The Color Purple take off. Like we've got Daniel Brooks and Taraji B. Henson waiting in the wings and we'll see if either of them is gonna be like a front runner. But yeah, if, if they're not, then I could see potentially Divine Joy Randolph being a front runner. As for Best Picture, I'm gonna say yes, because it came second in the People's Choice Award vote at TIFF. And also, it's an Alexander Payne movie. Like, his movies typically do get nominated. Well, not downsizing, that was a bit of a misstep for Alexander Payne, but his three previous films, The Descendants, uh, Nebraska, and Sideways, they all got nominated for Best Picture, and Best Director as well, which kind of implies that he has a pretty good chance of getting in for directing as well. Yes, it is a sweet Christmas movie, but I don't think they're gonna penalize him for that. I actually think the director's branch are going to appreciate that Payne had an intention of making a 70s movie and he clearly delivered that. He succeeded in that goal. Best Director is looking very crowded though this year, so there is a chance that he could miss, but I actually think that this is his best film since Sideways, so I hope he doesn't miss. Cinematography could happen. Like, this is a very good looking movie. The contrast of exteriors and interiors is very apparent. The lighting is soft, wholesome, and fuzzy. It feels like a relic of the past, but without feeling like nostalgia bait. Best original screenplay for David Hemmingson feels like a lock to me. It could even be a credible threat to Past Lives and Barbie. Also, I think it could get into editing. Even though the film isn't particularly flashy, it is very well stitched together. Like for two hours and 15 minutes, this movie flows so nicely. And again, it does have an old fashioned editing style, but it doesn't feel like it's pandering. It's not saying like, hey, look, we're doing it like the good old days because we know you like that. It just feels 
very natural and well suited to the film. And that's probably it for Oscar nominations. It might get an honorable mention in costumes, production design, maybe score, but I don't feel as confident in those categories because it's just not as strong in those departments. What do you think? How many Oscar nominations is The Holdover gonna get and in which categories? What do you think? Let me know in the comment section down below. All right then, should we ask them three questions? Firstly, would I watch it again? Absolutely. Like The Holdovers is genuinely a Christmas movie I could happily watch on annual view. Actually, it's a movie I could watch even when it's not Christmas. That's how good it is. That's how rewatchable it is. So yeah, I'm gonna be watching this movie many times. Expect to see it on the wall at some point. Question two, do I recommend it for you guys? This is such an easy movie for me to recommend to everyone. Like it is such a crowd pleaser and a pretty inoffensive one at that. I think all ages of people and genders will enjoy this film. It's heartfelt, it's funny, it's a simple story, but very well executed. The performances are strong and it's just so well crafted. And because of the old fashioned way that it's shot, it kind of feels like a classic already. So yeah, I recommend this film for everybody, okay? Watch it in a cinema with a crowd if you can, okay? You'll thank me. And third question, what score to give it out of 10? The Holdovers is a real gem of a film. It's just this sweet little movie with this lovely message about being more kind and compassionate to one another. And I love that it's sweet, but not too sweet. I'm looking for faults, but besides maybe a few people finding maybe a little bit too long, I really don't have a negative word to say about this film. I really loved it. So it gives me great pleasure to say that I'm gonna give The Holdovers a 10 out of 10, but I also think it's a movie that everybody should watch at least once before they die. But I think this is the type of movie that people will gladly rewatch every year when Christmas rolls around. Say hello to a new Christmas classic you're gonna find in your rotation every December. It's gonna be like Home Alone, Muppet's Christmas Carol, and The Holdovers. But as always guys, it's just one bloke's opinion. I wanna hear from you. Are you excited for The Holdovers? Have you seen it? If you have, what did you make of this movie? How does it rank for you in all of Alexander Payne's filmography? Whatever you have to say about this movie, let me know in that comment section down below. If you've enjoyed the video, help me out with a little thumbs up button for more movie TV and Oscars related content. Don't forget to click subscribe, and as always, thank you guys so much for watching. For more things related to movies, TV, the Oscars, and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Carefield, and I'll see you next time.